I'm Nyleen Clark. I am a classified senator here at Fresno City College. I work in the Office of Instruction as curriculum assistant, and I'm also joined by Susie Nitzel and Andrea Torres, um, both also classified, well, Andrea, classified senator, Susie, Senate president. Um, uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our first anti-racism seminar of the semester, second of the year. If you would like to re-watch this session or any of our past sessions, this one is being recorded and uh, will be posted with all the other sessions on the Fresno City College Professional Development YouTube site. Um, this is a, uh, these sessions, this anti-racism uh, seminar series is a, an effort to support the classified Senate goals of demonstrating a commitment to anti-racism and promoting effective communication among classified professionals, students, faculty, and administrators. So the, the people that are leading these presentations are our very own faculty, the discipline experts that have uh, created these trainings specifically for us classified professionals, and we are the only ones here in attendance. So this is um, specifically for us and a place for us to be able to ask questions that we've always wanted to. Um, please do so in the Q&A feature on the side of the screen. Um, you can ask questions anonymously throughout the, the seminar and we will uh, ask the presenter uh, on your behalf. Um, so we are going to get started. We're here with Matt Espinosa Watson. He is a full-time instructor at Fresno City College in the Chicano Latino Studies area. He also teaches American Studies uh, courses along with the Anthropology Ancient Mexico course. So I'm going to hand it over to him. He is going to be talking about Beyond the Headlines and Talking Heads and Introduction to Critical Race Theory. Thank you so much, Nyleen. Thank you, Susie. Thank you to, to the Classified Senate for inviting me here. Um, I was telling Nyleen and, and telling all of us as we were getting started here, just that I'm, yeah, I'm excited and nervous to be um, talking to a new audience and, and, and also to people I, I know um, and, and some that I, that I haven't met yet. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited for this sort of collaboration and just to, to share um, some of the, the work we do. Um, and so, I want to preface also, I guess, the presentation by sharing the idea that um, that critical race theory is something I, I studied in depth in law school, which was about 20 years ago now when I got my law degree and then came out of law school. Um, it's something I studied in depth in law school, and it's not something I teach every day, but it is something that informs how and what I teach every day and on that day-to-day -day level of what we do within Chicano Latino studies and on a more broader level within ethnic studies um, at Fresno City College. So I, I um, again, spent a lot of time thinking about how to best introduce this topic. And uh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start by going to the headlines or at least a couple of them. These are just recent things that kind of popped up, um, right? But Florida school district canceling a professor's civil rights lecture over concerns that it might be seen as critical race theory, which is right, like that's, um, this is again, January 22. Um, Texas school district pulls books by acclaimed black author amid critical race theory claims, right? Like the book is teaching kids this, this forbidden type of, of, uh, of, of thing, um, ideas, right? And then I'm sure many of you saw in, the, in recent times, right, the Virginia governor's race, and this was, you know, toward the end of last year, um, the back and forth about critical race theory as it became, it became like a huge topic within the governor's race in, in uh, Virginia, right? And so Glenn Youngkin saying he would ban it if he became governor. And then on the other side, uh, the Democratic candidate saying it, it doesn't exist in his state in Virginia. Um, and, and so um, that's the type of thing that I wanted to address specifically is this kind of, uh, again, these headlines and these things that it is, it has started becoming a topic that um, we see more often in the news, right? And I, I think that's the last headline piece that I that I left, but I, I, I thought um, that the blurry sign in the background was also kind of useful, right? Thinking about how it's being talked about in the media, right? Um, and of course, media and our whole society is more and more divided and partisan than ever. Um, and it depends on what media you're, you know, you're paying attention to, to, to tell you about what critical race theory is. But, um, but, you know, at least one impression that you might get from 
again, reading, reading into this at all, is that it's a, you know, critical racist theory. Stop teaching critical racist theory to our kids. Stop teaching our kids of, um, to be racist and to only see each other as their race and to see. So let's, let's, uh, let's dive in. So um, the outline of, of what I want to share with you all um, and to get to discussing an introduction to critical race theory has to do with me, my story, a little teeny bit. Um, my the, the topic and the subject that I teach in on again on the everyday um, within Fresno City, which is Chicano Latino studies, um, and to talk a little bit about the background of, of that area of study. Let's talk a little bit about that to help us then um, kind of transition into thinking about critical race theory and a little bit about its history and background. Um, dealing, looking at some of the myths and realities, and I've got some some cool slides from from Instagram that I'll tell you about once we get there. Um, and you know, borrowing others' work and with credit, of course. And then the last, I want to wrap up with um, what I think is a really good example of of a topic that uh, critical race theory helps us better understand, which is the idea of the legal and social construction of something we call race. So it's uh, it's ambitious. I do hope that um, right to um, uh, to, to get into discussion with you all on these topics. And, and so uh, again, very much encourage you to ask questions um, in the chat or, or um, and then uh, in, after in discussion as well. So, so the, the, the piece I'm gonna start with again is, is myself and, um, and thinking again about you know, the, the foundations of critical race theory led me to thinking about ethnic studies and how it was related to that. And then about how my own relationship to ethnic studies, law, and the topics that I teach, right? Um, I would say that one good, you know, one, it's a great place also to point out the idea that within the ethnic studies disciplines that I'll talk more about within critical race theory, personal stories are very important, right? Um, there is uh, this, um, so the, the idea of um, the validity of people's lived experiences is, is really core, I think, to both ethnic studies and critical race theory. The idea in particular that people of color who have experienced racism within this country and within our society, that their lived experiences are, are valid. Um, so there's, again, there's, there's something there that is connecting to, to all of these disciplines, which is that personal piece. Um, and so thinking about, again, my own foundations, um, at least with regard to Chicano studies and law, um, I think about the valley, um, the fact that that um, my uh, grandparents, at least on my mom's side, came here to work in the fields, as many people did, and uh, many generations of many different groups and ethnicities have as they've come to the valley. Um, this is, uh, again, a little bit about my foundations. Where do I come from? So um, on one level, I think it's important to share with you all that, like, um, I not just I wouldn't be here if I didn't teach in ethnic studies because that's a topic you all are getting into today or or again the broader topics of race and anti racism. Um, but that I actually wouldn't be here without ethnic studies or Chicano studies, um, because that's where my parents met um, Kurt Watson, who was from Granada Hills, California, and uh, Maria Lisa Espinosa, who grew up in Mendota, California, here on the west side. Um, and was a transfer student from West Hills College, uh, as my dad was a transfer student from one of the community colleges in LA to Cal State Northridge, right? And so uh, my parents met at Northridge in the 70s, um, actually in a Chicano studies class. And this was something, this little detail that, that, that hit me much, much later in life or more recently as I reflected back and the fact that that's literally like where, you know, the, the discipline I teach in is where my parents met. It wasn't either of their major or anything like that, but it was, they had exposure to the discipline at least. And that's where they first came into contact. Um, so that's, that's part of my experience is also right, being biracial, being somebody who grew up with, um, with um, the last name Watson. I've now it's just been a couple of years ago that we officially changed it to like Espinosa Watson um, to reflect both of my parents, uh, uh, at least maiden names. <laughs> um, and so, um, so that's part of my, again, lived experiences is, is that idea of growing up being Mexican or Mexican-American, but also being white and knowing both of those things were the case and, and trying to navigate that and understand um, a lot of that. So uh, again, part of my interest in any of these topics is informed by that, right? Is informed by those inquiries and those like, how come I'm, so I'm part of that group, but they don't see me as part of their group, but those people do and, and navigating those, again, those social realities, right? Um, so that's, that's a piece of, again, the identity piece. I would say in terms of my interest in law, 
it really has everything to do with one incident, which was my, my grandfather being killed in a farm labor accident when I was about 10 years old. Um, and, and this happened, um, as you can see, out on the west side near Mendota. Um, and this was um, my, you know, my first exposure to law and lawyers, right, was uh, my mom was the eldest daughter in her family. So was the, the one, in a sense, responsible for helping uh, my grandmother to kind of navigate the aftermath of this. And, um, and get an attorney and all these things. And so um, let's see. So the basic idea I think that I want to share is that like my grandmother um, would have worked in the fields until her death, I think, in terms of like didn't have a retirement plan. She was a farm worker. Um, and but because of a lawyer, a, you know, a good lawyer coming in in this case, um, there was there was the ability to kind of not fix anything that happened. Right? Obviously, the loss of life. But to, but to remedy the situation in a way that my grandmother was able to kind of live out the rest of her life in relative comfort that she wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, the incident, though, is, again, one that I've you know, experienced as a kid, but that I reflected a lot on many years later and have over time. Um, and I think part of what I, part of what was, uh, what, what I was conscious of at that age, at 10 years old, right, was the idea that, um, that my grandfather was killed in this accident, partly because he was a farm worker and because he was a Mexican farm worker and because he was an immigrant that took, that had those sorts of jobs where you could die because the, you know, the, the earth caved in around you. Um, and that, you know, important people in our society wouldn't have had that sort of job to begin with, but, but if they were important in our society, like certain safety precautions would have been taken and these things wouldn't have happened. So, um, again, that's just that's that's a huge piece of at least knowing a little bit of my background, but also like what led me into any interest in law. Um, and, and again, I would say that informed that very much so. Um, it wasn't until my first year in college that I got to take uh, my first course in Chicano Latino studies, and that was at Fresno State. And this was the book that um, was being used. It's still very much a, a main book in the in the field. And again, I want to I want to move on, um, share a little bit about my experience at Fresno State. Um, was very informed by. I wouldn't, I don't think I would be teaching at Fresno City today if it weren't for this individual um, who you may have heard of or know of, but who was uh, um, a professor at Fresno State in Chicano Studies when I was there in the late 90s. Uh, he went on to finish his kind of teaching career at, the UC, at UC Riverside, um, but he was selected by the Obama administration in, in 2016 to be the poet laureate of the United States, right? And so Juan Felipe Herrera was, uh, again, just one of my teachers at Fresno State one of the people who really, um, again, got me, uh, got me super excited about the idea of being a teacher, not just kind of the subject, which I was already interested in, but the way he approached the classroom and the interactions with students was something I just still reflect on and, uh, and I'm inspired by. Um, also just throw in there, his, his books are mostly poetry, but he's also got some great kids books out there, a bilingual one um, that is, uh, about the, the flea market or the remate, uh, the cherry action down here in, here in South Fresno. So from Fresno State, I went on to study law, again, which is part of why I'm here for race theory and the connection to, to law. Um, and so I went on from Fresno State to UC Berkeley. And um, so just a picture of the law school there as it's been, it didn't look exactly like that when I was there, but it's, it's changed a little. Uh, it's still in the same corner of campus, though, and and so when I went uh, to school there, it was again with the really express intention of wanting to like use law as a tool for social justice in our society, right? As a tool for helping out the little guy in in whatever uh, case that 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 um, um, would come up, and so um, so. Um, I'm gonna wrap up this, this piece real quick, but to say like, I, I started off law school, I got about halfway through, decided I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be an attorney. And I essentially kind of just dropped out of law school, um, lived in Oakland, worked in some grocery stores and lived my life for a couple of years before um, uh, getting an opening by a Dean of Students, a very, con um, uh, Vicky Ortiz, who, who was there, who encouraged me to come back and finish my degree and which is what I did. When I went back to finish my degree, I was no longer going to school with the intention of being a lawyer. Um, that was the intention early on, right? Um, and so when I went back, I had three semesters left and, and their law school's kind of interesting in this way that beyond the first year of core requirements, like your second and third year, you take whatever you want. Are they law classes? Then good, they fill up your schedule with them and that's how you get a law degree, right? There was really just the first year was the main requirement stuff. 
Um, and so my, my time when I went back to law school was really focused on like the classes I could take that were gonna really interest me and feed my, you know, my, my, um, my general interest about studying law and society. And that weren't necessarily gonna be the most practical classes for like taking the bar exam and becoming a practicing attorney. So I kind of avoided the civil procedures and the, the courses that were, that, that seemed boring to me. And I, and I navigated myself toward everything that the campus offered with regard to race and American law and um, social issues and the law and legal and social implications of the war on drugs and all sorts of things like that, that just were, um, were of great interest to me. That led me to where I am now. Again, this is uh, the kind of transition point of 2011 uh, where Profe, uh, uh, Professor Arturo Amaro retired and I took on the full-time position in Chicano Latino Studies and some of the students we were working with, with Mecha, uh, the student group at that time. Okay, so um, I know again, the presentation isn't about this topic, right? But it's, it's we're getting there pretty quick uh, to the, the, the main uh, event here of looking at CRT. So um, in terms of Chicano Latino studies, that we, again, that's what we call it on our campus at Fresno City College. It goes by a lot of names depending on the campus. And again, the time period also names have changed over time, but um, some places it's Mexican American studies, Latina and Latino studies. Um, there's more X's involved in things, which we'll talk more about in March, I believe, in identity. And um, if those of you who hopefully can join us for a conversation about about these terms and about identity within the Latino or Latina population. So at Fresno State, the last one there at Fresno State, it's called Chicano Latin American Studies. The, so the point is you might, you know, this discipline is called a lot of things. Um, you know, on our campus, we, it's the first one, Chicano Latino Studies. Um, so again, I don't wanna get into, I'm not trying to get into an in-depth history of, of everything that took place that's related to this, but I wanna give a sense that, again, about these connections that we can draw between uh, Chicana and Chicano studies, ethnic studies, and, um, and critical race theory. So, um, so the, the, the really important thing that I want to share here is just the background that is, is relevant to Chicana, Chicano studies, as relevant to ethnic studies generally, and that is that they come, they're, they're academic disciplines that come directly out of struggle and protest and student and communities organizing to create a space on, on campuses um, for students who historically had not been part of these institutions of higher ed. Um, and then also not just a space for those students, but a space for the, the subjects and them to explore the questions and ideas that mattered to them. That's, that's my kind of summary of like what, what was going on at that time, right? And so um, I'm gonna just breeze through some slides. And again, I hope that maybe they'll just, uh, I, students often are, are interested in some of these slides that I present that have to do with like Fresno and Valley history that people have never seen kind of talked about. But, um, you know, part of understanding why, why does ethnic studies happen in 1968, 69? That's around the time period that ethnic studies, and again, all these sub-disciplines that are associated with it. I would say 68, 69 is the, is the academic year that it, that it comes about. Um, so part of the background of it has to do with, you know, civil rights movements and the 60s period, right? Um, but also very particularly, um, the, in the in the valley, right? Um, the the farm worker movement, right? And that like the the visibility of Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and others who were um, really the most you know the lowest rung of society and the you know the um, uh, who were who were standing up for themselves and that that you know led a lot of other people to ask like hey well you know if they're doing it right if they're if they're confronting these huge agribusiness interests and are trying to you know and are standing up for basic rights and these things then you know can't we do that also and so there, there's you know that inspiration is huge in terms of understanding um again chicano studies in particular ethnic studies in the 60s and so marches to delano um walkouts or blowouts that happened in east la schools in 1968 a book on the left an hbo film from 2006 on the right both are, are, are great to check out if you're interested in that history of students walking out of schools in East LA in 1968 that led to walkouts throughout California and throughout the Southwest, including here in the Valley. Um, and so, um, so now we're gonna get to just a few, a few black and white images that are again from our, from our um, area, of, from Fresno and from basically, um, again, 1968, 69 time period. So um, these are images also from a, a book called The Slow Death of Fresno State, a California campus under Reagan and Brown. It's a book that's out of print, but it, it's about 
struggles on uh, Fresno State during, during this time. And so the hunger strike of Chicano students that we're seeing here had everything to do with the two main things going on that they were striking for and protesting about um, as we're looking at this time period. And one is the creation of EOP and or the funding of EOP in order to recruit these black and brown and then students of color, like for the first time onto our campuses, EOP was super crucial in those efforts. And it began 1967, San Jose State became statewide. And that was like EOP and ethnic studies and they're, they're, they're tied in in this fundamental way in terms of how they began as bringing those students onto campuses, those students then kind of leading the way to these programs. So I, I just want to give you the sense of, again, some of those images that tell us a little bit of a, you know, tell a story about what's going on at the time, right? And so the vice president of Fresno State being followed around by campus minority students, encounters that happened between Chicanos and students from the School of Ag. Um, a lot of the elders that I've talked to from the, who are you know, part of the, on the Chicano side, at least, those are the ones I've talked to, um, you know, said that the, the common idea was that they were being told by many times the, you know, the, the owners of the farm or the son of the farm owners um, of the big, you know, again, big agribusiness interests in the valley, uh, being told to, you know, to go back to where they belonged and go back to the fields where they belonged, that they didn't belong here on this, you know, university campus. Again, this is uh, Fresno State. So, um, so lots happened. There's like, I mean, people got put in jail, people got kicked out of school in order to create something called Chicano Studies. And again, I'm going to just say that this, you know, I do want to share those images because again, who's, who's ever seen that about that's Shaw Avenue? What? And so um, I'm going to breeze through and, and end that piece and say uh, there's a YouTube channel that has some elders talking about their experiences. If you're interested in any of that um, about back in the day here in Fresno, it's called Chicano History Revisited. Um, and so, okay, so let's get beyond Chicano studies into the ethnic studies broadly and that'll take us to CRT. So um, right, this, uh, this discipline um, in many places around the state, it, is, it, it, is, it comes on along with these other disciplines that are again today called ethnic studies. In the Bay Area, that was uh, a collaboration between students at SF State and UC Berkeley that was called the Third World Liberation Front. And it was these four different kind of major groups, Asian American, Native American, African American, and Chicano, Chicano students uh, working together, right? Um, and again, that was just a, a little bit of, of the Bay Area context. And so, these disciplines, and again, I'm the one I'm in, I'm talking most about, um, but it goes for, for all of the others as well. They, they start off as, as interdisciplinary and, uh, and transdisciplinary, going across these different disciplines or um, uh, you know, academic areas of study like sociology, anthropology, psych, political science, history, and education. Um, and ethnic studies continues to do that as well as um, be its, its own program, right? You can get PhDs today in these ethnic studies fields, which you, know, you couldn't have done 20 years ago. Um, and um, so I'm gonna fill, um, wrap this piece up with talking about the changes taking place that I think have a lot to do with the idea that CRT is being taught in our schools or that the kids are gonna be taught how to hate people um, in other states in Texas or Florida. So. What's, what's going on on a statewide level? Well, um, you may have know about this, but in the last couple of years, um, there's been statewide legislation to make ethnic studies classes a part of a CSU graduation requirement, right? So that's a new um, area in, in, the, um, in general ed that students uh, have to, uh, are going, you know, going to have to take. And I've been part of you know, some of the conversations that have happened around this. This was in 2020, talking, to, talking with folks on the statewide level about what does that mean um, to bring ethnic studies concepts into the K-12 system um, and to require classes like this at, at the high school level. Um, so um, in Fresno, right, the Fresno Unified, as you can see here, this is a post from Fres Fresno Ethnic Studies Coalition. Um, in Fresno, right, Fresno Unified School District decided to go ahead and support the idea of ethnic studies as a graduation requirement and are rolling that out a lot sooner than what ended up being, I think the statewide requirement is by 2029, 2030, that everybody who graduates high school is gonna have an ethnic studies course, right? So again, there is this idea like ethnic studies being implemented into the K-12 system. And that's, that is happening, right? And that's, that's part of what's going on. And again, I think that's part of what's going on that might be being confused also for critical race theory being taught to students in, in an elementary school or something. So, um, so let's, let's again, make this transition. Ethnic studies, um, 
emerges um, in, in both the literature and in all the conversations I've had with, again, these elders who were around and created these programs, um, they, they speak often about this idea of a critical mass, right? The idea that there were African-American students at Fresno State or UCLA or other schools in the 50s and in the 40s and in the 30s. They, they were few and far between, right? There's fewer of them. And, and part of what, again, is talked about so often is this idea of a critical mass, meaning that it, it wasn't until these EOP programs are coming about and are recruiting larger numbers of African-American students or Mexican-American students, and they're now coming to college together and talking about their experiences and debriefing on those, right? But that, that, um, that ethnic studies didn't emerge in the 40s or 50s because there were just those one, there were that one student in the class and everybody else was, was white, right? Because that, that was who attended universities at that point in time. And so that critical mass thing, I, again, I think is important because on some level it happens in the you know, general CSU and UC system in the, in the late 1960s. And I would say that in, in many ways it takes really kind of like another 20 or 30 years for that same critical mass of enough students experiencing this, this thing together and, and debriefing and talking about their own experiences with each other and asking questions that are critical of you know, what they're being taught. Um, it takes another 20 or 30 years for those students in a sense to, to you know, be gaining access to higher level grad schools and professional schools. And I will say that I think in many respects that's because of affirmative action programs, right? That were, that were widespread throughout the country and our state um, our state, uh, well, I don't know if you know, but our state did do away with affirmative action back in the, the late 90s, right, with Prop 209. And affirmative action is right now is, is uh, coming back before review of the U.S. Supreme Court, who were t just a couple of days ago um, said they're going to hear a case coming out of Harvard um, and one coming out of University of North Carolina that, you know, that many, uh, uh, I guess, uh, writers at least and, and uh, folks are speculating might, might be an end to those programs on a federal level. Um, but you know, we'll wait and see. Okay, so, so again, that's trying to tie these, these pieces together. I say, um, so although there, there certainly was, you know, some of the roots of, of critical race theory scholarship is in the 70s, um, it's, it's really the 80s and 90s, I would say the late 80s and then the 90s as a decade that critical race theory really begins to, like more scholars begin to get published and their books are being published and their law review articles are being published. And they're, you know, the, um, it's becoming more known even in a law school setting. So I'll just say when I went to law school in, um, again, the late 1990s, it was the early 2000s, basically between 2000 and 2004, um, you know, UC Berkeley and UCLA had classes in critical race theory and Stanford did, but probably none of the other law schools in the state did at that point in time, right? 10 years later, you had more schools that had at least a course in it or a course in race and American law or, something along those lines, right? But, um, but my sense is that again, going back to when I was in school, at least it was something kind of seen as new. It was definitely not accepted by everybody on the in, in the institution in many ways, similar to the way ethnic studies has often been treated on college campuses um, throughout its history, right? Um, but it was something that was, that was kind of, again, seemed, seemed sort of new at that, at that point in time. And again, that I felt very thankful that I was at the campus I was because I, I was, again, well aware that like that, um, those options to take the courses I did wouldn't have existed at many of other many other campuses at again at that point. Um, so, this is the the piece I said you know I'm going to go to Instagram because um, I I came across this actually before I'd even agreed to do this talk I came across this um, on my phone on Instagram and saved these things because I thought I would use them for my American Studies 11 class the Law and Democracy course uh, which I teach that it's part of the the Law School Pathway program that Fresno City has. And, um, and so I teach that class generally in the spring, so I'm teaching it this semester. And so I had saved these for, for that purpose. But then once again, um, after being uh, approached by Nyleen and talking about this, I, um, I was like, oh, this is, this, these might fit in very well here as well. So what is critical race theory? It's a framework that's used to help us understand why racial inequalities exist and how we can eradicate them. Okay, it's a framework, a set of theories and ideas to help us understand why racial inequalities exist, inequities, excuse me, and how we can eradicate them. So as, as the, 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 post, the person who posted this says here, right? CRT has been getting a lot of attention. This is to clarify what it is and misconceptions. 
I, I thought I'd just at least share, again, this is who posted it. She's an artist from Toronto. I don't know her well or know her at all, but I liked what she's posted and, and I've seen some of her other stuff. And so just, again, just to, to share and to give credit where it's due here. Um, I've got a couple slides from her that I wanna uh, share with you all. So she gives a definition. CRT, critical race theory, is an academic framework or practice that examines how systems, policies, and the law perpetuate systemic racism. And so I think, again, a good general statement that, yes, certainly fits with what I've learned about the, about the, the, you know, the, the area of study. It is called critical because it asks you to look critically at systems to better understand the origins of racial inequities. Um, this knowledge is then, can then be used to mitigate and stem inequities at the root cause, like the policy or the law at the root. Um, and again, part of what I appreciated about this particular, again, um, artist and the way she's put things together and put them out here was um, just even this note right here. While there are similarities, CRT is not anti-bias, anti-racism education. CRT isn't culturally relevant teaching. CRT isn't diversity and inclusion training. CRT is not multicultural education. And CRT, again, and ethnic studies, they have a lot of overlap, but they're, they are, you know, uh, also their own things too, right? And so, so I want to, you know, emphasize, I guess, the idea that, um, that, like, my talk this month is really more about trying to give that introduction to what is critical race theory, but to also talk about maybe how um, the versions of critical race theory that I learned in law school are not really what's being implemented at any elementary school, whether in Texas, Florida, or California. However, um, uh, Victoria Navarro Benavides, who's a new faculty member with us in Chicano Latino Studies, um, is, is going to be speaking to you all uh, next month about how critical race theory is being used in schools and how it is being, um, and how theories from critical race theory have really informed, in particular, the discipline of education. I would say sociology, education, and ethnic studies um, have borrowed a lot from these theories coming out of law school settings. Um, in, in recent times, right? And so, so I think my talk is maybe more focused on why, again, why, why kids aren't learning CRT in schools. And, and she's gonna give you a little bit of a sense of like, well, when they are, this is what we're talking about, right? And so I just wanted to kind of throw that, that piece in here and also encourage you to check out next month. So I love this one. It's a lot and we don't have to break it all down here because it's like, oh, here's some, a few key CRT themes, right? Um, which align with other anti-racism approaches. Number one, race is a social construct created to benefit white people. Again, we can talk more about it. Um, and that is a piece of what I do wanna actually talk more about it um, as I get into examples. Um, number two, systemic racism exists across many spectrums, criminal justice, policing, housing, healthcare, education, banking, politics. Um, number three, the idea of a few bad apples is a false narrative. Racism is both individual and systemic. Right? And so there's uh, it's certainly worth paying attention to individual racism and, and our own right, um, implicit bias and all these things that are, have to do with the individual. Yet um, CRT is really focused on the systems approach, I would say, uh, more than anything. It's about how, how race and racism are built into the law. Right? Um, uh, number four, white privilege leads to false ideas of meritocracy, um, of, of who deserves certain things and who doesn't. Right. Um, the idea, number five, colorblindness, the idea of colorblindness invalidates racialized people's experiences. And so if you're hearing that term racialized for the first time, um, it has everything to do with back to number one here. Race is a social construct. It's something that's created. And so the idea of racialization is people being made to be white or black or whatever the category might be. So I won't try to uh, go into more of that just right now. but. Um, Let's see, six, again, I think all of these are really crucial core ideas. I wouldn't go through the list otherwise. Um, six, the experiences of oppression are exacerbated when a racialized person has additional marginalized identities. Um, this is most famously discussed by, again, a, a law professor who is one of the key names in CRT um, named Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and she has a really excellent TED talk also out there on the idea of intersectionality. Um, but that's a that's a topic that's that's talked about a lot again outside of just CRT. It's talked about across a lot of disciplines these days, um, and within again diversity, equity, and inclusion work as well. Right, it's like one of those pieces that does overlap. Um, 
Number seven, internalized racism occurs when a racialized person believes they're inferior to white people. Number eight, racialized people have valid and unique experiences that need to be heard. And again, I, I, that number eight kind of I hope recalls the beginning of the presentation and talking about the kind of the personal experience and the idea that, that people's lived experiences are valid, right? Um, like I think part of the critical nature of whether it's ethnic studies or critical race theory, part of what's critical there was the idea that, um, that whether it was again, um, Mexican Americans attending Fresno State in 1969 or whether it was a group of black students attending UCLA in the 1990s, um, that, um, that they were being told essentially that their lived experiences were invalid, that this is the reality, this is the truth about this situation. And so that doesn't match basically. The professor, the one with the, the degree, the one, with the, the one who's getting paid to teach the class is saying, this is the reality, this is the truth. This is the law and it's objective and it's neutral. And people were saying, hold on, my, live, my, my mom's experience hasn't been that. My brother's, my own experience has not matched up with what you're saying there. And, the, you know, and, and it's that, that disconnect, I would say in many ways that leads to um, a lot of new theories and ideas about how, how to, um, to talk about all this stuff. So I, I have more from this, this author, I, I think, um, uh, I'm going to kind of just breeze through a couple of these because I've got too much that I want to try to share with you all in a short time, but I, I do want to share this PowerPoint with everybody and make sure it's available and I'll make sure to connect with Susie and Eileen and, and Andrea to make sure that that's the case, right? But I think this is really useful, the idea that the misconceptions and, and, and the truth, right, about what is critical race theory, um, right? A misconception number three, does critical race theory blame white people for all racial inequities in society and atrocities in the past? Uh, no, it recognizes, though, that race and racism are woven into the fabric of our institutions. Um, does it force educators to teach material that makes everyone uncomfortable? Uh, no, no, that's not what it's doing, right? Um, um, does it make students feel like victims? Is it about victimization, about dividing people into oppressed and oppressor? And again, I think I, I very much appreciate those because the misconceptions to me is everything that I've seen in the in the media, I guess, as of late, right? Um, uh, or most of what I've seen, at least in terms of like, this is what CRT is doing and this is what people are trying to teach to our kids, right? Um, and um, not so much. So I'm gonna just focus on this last one though, the last slide I have from, um, from Sylvia Duckworth here. Um, misconception is the idea that critical race theory reinforces racial stereotypes and traumatizes students. No, that's, I mean, if, if that, that could be done, certainly, right? Um, that could be done talking about sensitive issues, right? Um, and I, I guess I want to recognize that reality also, but that's not what it's, no, that's not what the discipline is about. That's not what the theories are grounded in, and that's not what should be being done, right? Um, so the truth here is that race is a social construct. So let's, let, I want to pick that apart and examine it and, and use that again, example and, um, and then I'll talk more with you all about, about all of these things and what's interesting you here. So um, uh, I'll leave the summary as is and, and let's, let's say. So um, let's, let's get into this idea of, of race, legal and social construction of race. Um, so I put here, most of us right, believe, grew up believing in the idea of race as a biological or scientific reality. Um, and I'm speaking for all of you, but I, you know, as I as I might for my students, and say, okay, but it, did you, if you didn't, let's talk about that, and, and let's talk about it. But um, but that in general, right? I mean, that's that's the idea I grew up with through popular culture and through school as well. I would say. Right. And so, um, when I say in actuality, though, investigating the ideas we've inherited make it make it very clear that race is a social and legal construct. Um, it's a, it's something created by by our society and created in particular by, by judges and court opinions and rulings that happened um, throughout our country's history. So again, just another way of saying, what does it mean that race is a social and legal construct? Well, it's a category that's, a, that's created and given meaning by our society. Right? Um, and um, I, I include this piece as well and say, but, well, but isn't there some like biological reality to it too? Like people are from different areas of the world and we look different and yeah, you know, there, yes, there is some there. Um, so what I want to say, right, is that like, yes, as, um, as we talk about it from a, a perspective of like healthcare practitioners and stuff, that's, that's, um, that is a different kind of piece of the conversation, right? So certain diseases or conditions are 
are more prevalent among people from different parts of the world. There again, there is there's some scientific piece to to that, but that isn't the same as race, right? And I and um, and so let me let me get past what I don't know because I'm not a, I'm not a, a medical doctor nor um, a public health researcher. Um, but what I do know about is is again this this side of the the legal and social construction, right? So I wanted to use this example because it's also one that's just um, I've recently started. I guess investigating and sharing more with classes because of how often it's come up over the 20 years or so that I've been teaching. No, not that long. 15, excuse me. <laughs> so, um, so what is this? What are, have you seen this before? I think we've all seen this before. Census questions, right? So hold on. If you're Hispanic, um, is this person of Hispanic origin? Are you white? If you're white, are you white Hispanic or white non-Hispanic? Um, what does that mean? Why is it that, that Hispanics and people who are of Mexican and Latin American descent are talked about and classified as, as white within our country and within our system? Um, that's historically been the case, right? So I would say throughout much of the 20th century, the idea is that, um, that Hispanic, which is a category, again, that includes Mexican and Mexican American people and, um, and other people from throughout Central and South America, um, that that category, the, the box you're supposed to check here is you're white and then you're ethnically Hispanic. And you can tell us more about, again, which piece you are, right? But um, again, I think this, this, this kind of confusing piece of things that is part of our official government documents, um, I would say becomes a little bit clearer um, and become, makes a little bit more sense when we, when we use critical race theory to approach kind of like how did that get to be that way um, and, and, um, and how it, again, I think, and in doing so, hopefully we get a little bit of this insight into the idea of race as a, as a social and legal construction. Okay, so um, I, again, another great way of also getting some, that insight into, huh, that's interesting, but what the census calls us, calls us, whoever that us is, what the census calls people from 1790 to 2020 um, it's just, it's fascinating to look at the different names and categories that have been used, right? But like, there are points in that history where like Mexican is a racial category. I think it's in the 1930s and then it disappears. It's only there for one decade ever, but it's, and then it's gone, right? Um, there's, you know, so there's weird stuff like that that happens, but, but getting, uh, again, looking at something like this helps to understand like, oh, there's an instability here of these racial categories. They've changed and grown and expanded and, and contracted over time. And and it's not because people's skin color changed, right? It's not, and that's, again, obviously, I think that's, that's what most of us are taught that race is, race is skin color, right? And again, that's, that's a huge piece of the way it has worked and works in our society. Um, but, um, but again, the categories themselves and examining them helps us like get beyond that because it's like, no, that's clearly not all that's there. So I'm gonna use again, the example I know best um, that, it, that it, again, comes from my own teaching and comes from the stuff that I do on a regular basis. Um, and that's to, just to speak for a second about the idea of people of Mexican descent and racial identity. Um, this is what's called a casta painting um, from Mexico in the 1800s. It's kind of the time period just before Mexican independence um, uh, while, while Mexico is still a colony of Spain, right? And so in the 16 and 1700s, as Spain has taken over much of this part of the world, they're called the Americas, right? The places that they speak Spanish today. Um, uh, as their main language are, are pretty much the places Spain took over, right, in the 16, 17, 1800s, um, and so much of Central and South America, the Caribbean, and, and Mexico. Um, so within all of those countries, right, there is this reality that is going on, um, and in the reality that is going on here, the Spanish um, colonial authorities are trying to classify and keep track of. And what that is, is the racial mixture. Again, I'm just going to say the racial mixture, but the mixture of people, right, from different um, backgrounds um, in Mexico. And, um, and, and again, what this chart really represents is trying to keep track of what happens when Spaniards from Europe merge and have children with native people of the Americas, like Aztecs or Maya people? And then what happens also when those Europeans bring um, hundreds of thousands of African slaves with them into the Americas? And how do those three groups blend and interact over time? Right. Um, one of the fascinating things that I would say this chart also kind of just gives a little insight to is to the reality of, of racial mixture within Mexican history. Um, I, I learned 
it took, a, I guess, like a lot of kind of classes within Chicano studies and stuff for me back in the, the 90s to get beyond the idea that like Mexicans are just Spaniards and Indians. They're, you know, Cortes came and conquered the Aztecs and they made Mexicans and they're all, they're all just some different proportion of more Spaniard, more Indian or somewhere in the middle. Um, and again, that's the general, that's a general statement, a general thing I learned. It has some reality, but there's a lot more to it, right? There's a lot more mixture going on throughout the history. And so that's, that's just a piece. And I would say that some of you may be aware of this through DNA tests. A lot of my uh, students in the last 15 years, right? Um, we have a different, have a lot of questions when it comes up that they have 4% or 7% or 8% of African ancestry and are wondering like, what does that even mean? And how come nobody talks about that? And what does, it, does that mean I'm black? And what, so there's, there's, there's a DNA testing, I think again, especially for people of, of Mexican and Latin American descent, um, leads to a whole other set of questions also. And um, so, okay, so that's a reality, a little bit about the idea of mixture within Mexico, right? So that I'll say that there's a reality to that. There's, there's a lot of names there on that chart that are seen as offensive. And, um, but there's a reality to the, the, you know, people mixing together and having children that are, that are half Indian and half black. And then the, that child has a child with somebody who's half Spanish and half Indian and, and on and on. Um, so the, the time period I want to I wanna continue using as an example is in the 1800s. Um, and what this is, is actually a map, an official map of, uh, it's, a, it's the map used for treaty negotiations at the close of the Mexican-American War, right? And so the map should look wrong to us, right? On some level, because that's not the map we're used to seeing and it's not the, you know, not the reality we're used to seeing. So this is a map of the United States of Mexico, right? Um, again, in... Um, at a time period after which Texas is already being fought over in the 1830s. And so um, I'm sure, again, many of you all are familiar with the basic idea of this, this history that you know large parts of the US Southwest were once Mexico, right? Um, and so um, that's you know, expressed here in this map at the very least, right? And so, um, okay, so we see it in a, in a geographical form that border shifts and by 1848, the conclusion of the Mexican-American War um, we're more or less, besides the Gadsden Purchase, we're like, but more or less, we're dealing with the border that we know today, right? Like from 1848 onward, um, it's the map is going to look very different, and it's going to be more familiar to us. We're going to, you know, see it and recognize it. Um, okay, so, but why is uh, what's this, and how's this helpful to us? Well, the the time period of the Mexican American War is again a fascinating one to look into from a perspective of ethnic studies and or critical race theory, and I'll kind of give us a little bit of, of both and, and, and distinguish them in a sec. Um, this is a, a very um, well-known painting that you've probably seen in a US history book, or it might have been many years, but it's in most of the textbooks that are out there and was painted in the 1800s, had to do with American westward expansion um, and the idea of manifest destiny, right? And the idea of, of the, um, the westward expansion of the United States into the West, into these areas that were occupied by Indians and Mexicans. Um, and, and as you can see, there's, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot to analyze and this painting has been I think, written about and analyzed and, um, to death in some ways, but, uh, but the idea is, right, you kind of see the darkness on the edges here that the Indians uh, we see here on horseback and stuff are receding into as white America advances and brings civilization, brings, telegraph wires and electricity and, and railroads, right? And, um, and this is progress, this idea of, of this westward expansion. Um, again, the, the time period, um, the, the, the term manifest destiny is one that's like really tied into that time period. Um, and, and so the basic idea, to do a little back to that, that time period for us all, the basic idea is that it was the United States obvious, like it was manifest, it was clear in our face right here it was the obvious destiny of the US to spread westward from sea to shining sea. Um, part of what was built into that in terms of, again, examining like the literature at the time and stuff is, is that it's, it's very, you know, very clear when you look back and they wrote about it in a very open way at that point in time, right? But that, that, that you know, this idea was bound up with the idea of white Americans as God's chosen people, right? And that also as an obviously superior race of people that they would overtake the area from inferior people who stood in their way. Um, and, and again, so that's, um, again, one piece of Mexican-American history, I would say that I was exposed to in Chicano studies classes. 
that I hadn't been exposed to in US history classes when talking about the same time period, right? Um, and so again, I'm gonna say that this is kind of still ethnic studies with regard to this history and not yet necessarily critical race theory. But um, so again, just giving some more insight into the time period because this time period helps, helps us kind of put together the, the Hispanics as white piece. So um, to put it another way, um, I would say here, Samuel Houston, who was uh, the guy that the city of Texas is named after and one of the beginnings of breaking Texas away from Mexico, right? So he sums it up, I would say, and it's, it's helpful because it helps us understand a lot about kind of the history and the time period. Um, so Sam Houston says the Mexicans are no better than Indians. So I see no reason why we should not take their land, right? Like part of US expansion up until that point had been taking Indian land. Um, and so this is kind of along those same lines, right? And they're about the same as those folks, right? Aren't some of them Indians anyway? Like, right? Um, and so, okay, so that's a little insight into the, the, the what's going on as we lead into the Mexican-American War. I would say the war itself is just as much about, it's more about economics than anything. Um, most, some critical authors will say like that whole manifest destiny ideas about white, white Americans as God's chosen people. Like that was the rich people in America who stood to benefit off of this westward expansion, trying to sell that idea to the common white American and get them on board with it. But really what this was about was economic expansion. So there's that interpretation of it. But again, manifest destiny is a reality and it's, it's, it's in the magazines, it's in print all over the place in that time period, right? So, um, I, um, I'm going to fast forward and not talk about the war itself. We want to try to, again, get us, to, um, get us through this, is, uh, is the, the conclusion of the war um, happened. And you all know the basic idea of, again, the land that switched hands. That's the main thing that happened during that, that short war of two years, uh, 1846 to 48, um, is that you know, California through Texas becomes US land, right? We know that part. Um, the other piece that I'm going to just share with us is, is related to, well, what happens to those Mexicans who were already there, who were living in San Jose or who were living in San Antonio, Texas, or right? what happens to them? Um, so um, the treaty basically that ends the war says, number one, that they would get to become US citizens and enjoy the privileges of citizenship. Secondly, they would get to keep their land. Um, land grants from the Spanish or Mexican governments um, would be seen as valid. Um, and the, the, the third one's a little bit more of, we won't get into now, but that they, there's like cultural rights that are embedded within the treaty. I don't wanna um, spend some more time on now, but okay. So that's, um, that's the idea. Mexicans who were in that territory, that's California or Texas get to, get to keep, their, um, keep their land and they become citizens um, of the United States, right? So we'll come back to that in just one sec. Okay, so this war is over um, in 1848. And although the US went to war with Mexico to fight over the territory that is now US territory, California through Texas, um, and although we already know the outcome of this, that that's what ended up happening. That's what ended up, the US ended up taking at the conclusion of this war. Um, at the conclusion itself, though, in 1847, as this thing is wrapping up, this is a hot and huge topic within the US Congress is, okay, so we, we went to war initially to get this land, but then Mexico, once, once the US military occupied California through Texas, they tried to go to the Mexican government to negotiate and say, okay, like sign off on this, this is now ours, right? And the Mexican government said, no, it's still not yours, even though you're occupying it. So the US, the US perspective, at least, was that they were forced to then invade Mexico City and send thousands more troops and lots more fighting and death in order to like defeat Mexico in Mexico City in order to get them to sign off on this of, of again, release of these territories. So the basic idea I want to share with you here is that in the Congress at the time, it was like everybody's talking about race. Everybody's talking about the idea that like where we draw this line really matters because, right, if we draw too far south, we're going to have these half breeds, we're gonna, no, we're gonna have, excuse me, dark colored Mexicans and Indians who are gonna be part of our country. And so maybe we should draw the line down here. This is Sam Houston's proposal. The line that comes across here is if we draw it here, we're gonna get more of the folks who are gonna like integrate into our society a little bit better. And, um, and so some uh, politicians argued to take all of it and make it a colony essentially of the United States or make it a territory along the lines of Puerto Rico. Um, there's different arguments. Uh, Senator Calhoun, who's a former VP, um, says, you know, we've conquered many of these neighboring tribes of Indians, but we've never thought of holding them in subjection or incorporating them into our country. They've either been left as independent people or driven into the forests, right? And so 
I know that we've never dreamt of incorporating into our union any but the Caucasian race, right? To incorporate Mexico would be the first instance of incorporating an Indian race for more than half of them are Indians and the other is composed chiefly of mixed tribes, right? Um, and that the greatest misfortunes of Spanish America are because of putting these people, these colored races on an equality with the white race. And so, so Mexican-American war and where that line got drawn, there's, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about race and Indians and whether Mexicans are Indians or not. And that's a huge piece of influencing in actuality where a line gets drawn, right? Um, uh, this is maybe beyond where I've, what I've got time to address, but basically as California becomes California into the United States, right, there is, um, you know, a, a very brutal and intense history of like the government actually paying people to get rid of native people, right, to exterminate native people. And then, well, what's the difference between Mexicans and natives? And if you have a, so, okay. Um, Okay, so I'm, nobody's interested in reading this treaty right now, I'm, excuse me, but I'm gonna, I'll just, it's there for you in case you want the actual language for some reason. So, okay, so I'm gonna, um, where are we at? Doing okay on time, anybody? We're, we're <laughs> you wanna check in with me here, um, I, I've got a sense. So, um, okay, so in 1848, when this treaty gets drawn, the, the line gets drawn as we know it does, because we've seen a map of, of you know, our country in 2022, um, but uh, back in 1848, right, who could be a U.S. citizen? Um, well, the citizenship requirements that were on the books at the time in 1848 were laws that were back from 1790. Um, but those laws said that to be a citizen of the United States, you had to be a resident for five years, have good moral character, and that you be a free white person. Um, this was, again, very specifically to make clear that American Indians and African Americans were not eligible to be citizens of the United States. Right. Um, and again, I think, uh, okay, so, so left unsaid here was that this is also only men, right? Free white persons is only free white men who can become citizens, who can be citizens of the US. Um, the naturalization law from 1790. Oh, I don't know why that was later. Okay, so uh, treaty says Mexicans who live in California get to become US citizens, but the naturalization law on the books at the time that's still good law says who can become citizens? Well, free white people, free white men can become, can be citizens of this country of the United States. So, hmm. so what does that mean then, right? Is if the only people eligible for citizenship is this group, but this other group was told they're also, that, I mean, there's a treaty, treaties are pretty high up within the laws of our land, right below the constitution, right? Um, treaties are, are very well respected. So what does that mean? Um, well. I would say from 1848 onward, it was basically assumed in, in our system that like, well, since the treaty said Mexicans would become US citizens, it must have also been recognizing that they were white, right? Because otherwise, I mean, otherwise Congress wouldn't have put language into the treaty about them being citizens or being able to eligible for citizenship, right? But that was, I mean, it was never explicit. It was literally kind of an assumption that like, okay, well, since this piece and the treaty says they're gonna become citizens, and the only people who could be citizens are white people, then it must be the case that Mexicans are white. Um, and I mean, that really in many ways is the root of those census forms we're looking at. Um, give us just a little bit more and, and, and wrap up here. Um, and so I, I say here too, this is a couple pieces. I'm saying a lot of the history I've just shared with you about California is stuff that we talk about in ethnic studies, the stuff that we talk about in Chicano and Chicano studies. Um, and then this is a, a book, a, a great book I, I was exposed to in grad school at San Jose State. Um, and this uh, Tomas Almaguer is a professor of sociology at San Francisco State, um, but a, a book really examining like the early, early years of American California um, and uh, just an excellent one that I have a quote from that I wanna share with you all. And again, so I'm saying part of what I'm sharing here, I think in this little piece has been like an ethnic studies perspective on some of this, this history. And then we're gonna tie in where the, the CRT piece comes explicitly in and, and wrap up there. So um, Almaguer says, although Mexicans were technically determined to be white and thus able to own property, vote and have the other rights and obligations of citizenship, their legal rights were not always respected as one might imagine. Um, this was particularly true in the case of the working class who were often denied their rights by being categorized as Indians. Um, and a little, little more of the, the legal analysis of this time period, um, looking at some California laws. Um, the California Civil Code passed in 1850, 
basically um, tells us who can be witnesses in California courts, right? And so who can't be witnesses, excuse me. Um, who can't be witnesses are people who are of unsound mind and children, right, who aren't capable of distinguishing the truth from falsities and Indians, of course, or persons having one fourth or more of Indian blood in an action or proceeding to which a white person is a party we can't believe an indian over a white person that's like that's we need to build that into the law to make clear that you cannot take an indian or a half indian or a quarter indian's word over a white person's word that can't be the case right no and and then fourth negroes again using the language of the time or persons having one half or more negro blood um in particular again they could they could take the stand in an action against somebody of their own race right but not they could not take the stand in an action against a white person um Okay, so what is so just a little bit more on that and um, the last, I think, slide on the, the civil code section. Um, so just one notable instance reflects the case, the ease, excuse me, with which anyone with a dark complexion could be treated, could be so treated. Manuel Dominguez, who was served in as an elected delegate to the California State Constitutional Convention of 1849 as a member of the LA County Board of Supervisors. Um, so as a politician and a part of the, you know, writing the state constitution, um, uh, traveled to Northern California in April 1857 to testify in a San Francisco courtroom. Before he could testify, however, the Anglo lawyer for the plaintiff objected to his taking the witness stand. The lawyer argued Dominguez was an Indian and therefore ineligible to offer testimony. Uh, the judge upheld the objection and dismissed him. You, know, you can go back to LA now. Um, and uh, although Mexicans were, again, legally accorded the same rights, right, as free white persons, the actual extension of those privileges to the population was another matter. But it was there in the, in the law, right? Mexicans are white, but just not this one, because look at him, he's an Indian. Um, so um, in 1854, and just to give you, I think, I think this is a great example that is now we're kind of getting more into the, the, at least the stuff I learned through critical race theory classes in law school, and that was the People versus Hall. So 1854, the California Supreme Court, a very kind of notorious infamous case, reversed the conviction of a white man at a murder trial, holding that the testimony of Chinese witnesses to the crime was inadmissible because of the civil code section I showed you before. Um, you might be wondering like, hold on, did I, not, did I not see that section that said Chinese people couldn't testify? No, 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 that's, that's, that wasn't there, right? But, but in, 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 in the case, right, the court relied upon what we examined. Um, and the piece that said no black or mulatto or Indian can give evidence, right? And so even though they were not mentioned at all, uh, Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, Charles Murray says, the Chinese are clearly a race of people who nature is marked as inferior. And you know, if we let them testify, we're gonna assume at the polls and the jury box and in our legislative halls, and this is an actual and present danger. And so even though the law says nothing about them, we're just gonna assume that it means like pretty much all people who are not white cannot testify against white people. Let's just, let's be clear on this, right? Even though, again, the law didn't say, no, nothing about that. Um, so um, I'm gonna end with, again, um, this, this was a, a book I've, I've gotten a lot out of, I continue to kind of draw from, and he's actually one of the professors I had, um, was able to take classes with up at Berkeley um, when I was there, named Ian Haney Lopez. Um, the book, White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race is I think of just an excellent uh, book on the topic. And so we're coming back to the 1790 law. This is just a couple, I think two quotes or two pages from the book, um, right? 1790, naturalization to white people. We've seen that already. So though the requirements for being a citizen changed frequently after that, this racial prerequisite for citizenship endured until 1952, right? Um, from the earliest years of the country until just a generation ago, being a white person was a condition for acquiring citizenship. And so, I mean, this, that, that's a statement for me that makes, you know, that really leads to the question of like, how could you possibly understand American history and democracy and who got to participate and who didn't, unless we have this, this piece of this in, in our analysis, right? I mean, how could we possibly put together these pieces of our history unless we are, you know, using, using some of this? So uh, again, I think it's the last, I might have two quotes from it, but, um, whether you were white, however, was often no easy question to determine. As immigration reached record highs at the turn of the century in the early 1900s, right, countless people found themselves arguing their racial identity in order to become citizens of the United States. Right? From 1907 to 1920, over 1 million people gained citizenship under these racially restrictive um, laws. Many more sought to become citizens and were rejected. Um, and, um, oops, excuse me there. 
didn't happen. So naturalization rarely involved formal court proceedings, and therefore there's very few, if any, written records. However, there are a few of these cases, which are all about who's a white person and who's not, and uh, two of them are in the 1920s reached the US Supreme Court. Um, and they're, again, kind of famous cases within critical race theory. Um, these cases, as, as uh, Haney Lopez say, produce illuminating decisions that document the efforts of would-be citizens from around the world to establish their whiteness at law. Applicants from Hawaii, China, Japan, Burma, and the Philippines, as well as mixed race applicants, failed. No, th those people were clearly not white. However, conversely, courts ruled that applicants from Mexico and Armenia were white but vacillated over the whiteness of petitioners from Syria, India, and Arabia. Um, these cases are helpful because they reveal the contradictions inherent in establishing lines between who was and who was not white. Um, the, the, yeah, there is this last piece. So the courts had to establish whether race was measured by skin color, facial features, national origin, language, culture, ancestry, what the scientists at Harvard are saying, what they're writing about in Harper's Bazaar and popular magazines, or is it a combination of like common knowledge and science and geography? And, and what you get as you examine it, right, is there isn't a standard. There's, there's multiple standards all over the place. And even the United States Supreme Court, who decides one year that an applicant by the name of Ozawa, um, who from Japan cannot be a citizen and is not white, um, for the reasons that he's not part of the Caucasian race, according to science and everything else, right? Um, the next year um, in 1923, with an applicant named uh, Thind, uh, the, with the last name Thind, who's from uh, South Asia, from India, um, the standard is basically thrown out because this applicant, he's from South Asia and the Indian people could be kind of classified in the scientific way as Caucasian and they're related in some way, but we're not gonna rely on the science anymore, even though we just did last year. This time we're gonna look at this guy and say like, look, he's dark skinned, he's not white, we can tell. And the Supreme Court says this, right? I mean, they changed from one year to say, we need to rely on the science to the next year, just being like, no, look at this guy. No, clearly, clearly he's not. So um, I wanna throw in some just, yeah, I think some <laughs> extra reading for, for those who are interested, um, but in, in particular on this topic of whiteness and um, how the Irish became white is a great book that kind of gives you insight into the, again, the instability of these categories of who gets accepted and not. Um, the Irish, again, never changed their skin color much, but when they arrived in the country, they were basically segregated into black neighborhoods. And, um, and so again, there's, there's a whole story there. So um, I am at the wrapping up point, I promise. So becoming white, I say, um, was about being accepted by those in power in the United States, right? Um, it was never really just about skin color. Right, again, the Irish is a very good example of that, um, right? Um, and I'd say that, that in, in you know, numerous places that I've studied it throughout, you know, ethnic studies throughout law school and, and critical race theory, part of the idea of, of becoming white um, throughout this country's history meant in particular, the idea that you endorsed and accepted the idea of black inferiority, that that was what being white was about was about not being black. That's, that's the core of it. It's, I mean, throughout its history, what it's been about is about not being this other thing. And in particular, that was like the other pole um, that it was defined against in many ways. Um, so, um, as I mean, as I think I've shown you here, like from a big chunk of this country's history, legal whiteness is crucial to citizenship, to having basic rights, to being able to vote, to being able to, to enjoying those, those privileges of citizenship. Um, so a wrap here to say that successful challenges that happened in the 1930s and 40s, um, where Mexican American kids who are being segregated into inferior Mexican schools were, and that's all, sorry, on its own, right? But the segregation that was happening in, let's say, California, for example, right, um, is challenged in the 1930s and 40s. And before Brown versus Board, right? Before 1954 and this big decision that says, no, you know, segregation is wrong all over the place without, or, you know, in our country. Um, before that's happened, uh, Mexican and Mexican-Americans have, have made inroads into challenging segregation within, especially within the state of California. But when you look into the details of like, how were they successful in challenging that segregation? Um, mostly it was this, it was because oh, like, no, those kids are actually technically of the Caucasian race, so we can't discriminate against them and put them in a separate Mexican school because they're technically white, 
And that was kind of the legal argument, really, in a sense that, again, the Mexican, that the, the advocates for the Mexican-American community used in order to, right, to break down that, those, those barriers for their own children, right? And so it wasn't, you all know, I'm sure, the history of the broader um, right, Brown versus Board. But again, whether it's Lemon Grove in 1931 or Mendez versus Westminster out of Orange County in 1946, um, the major challenges again that happen and the reasons that Mexican Americans start integrating into American society in, in California in that sort of way, again, or into the education system with other um, white children has everything to do with this technicality that's in the background there, right? And so, um, and so yeah, Mendez is related to also Brown and um, Thurgood Marshall, who's working with the NAACP, um, meets with their lawyers as well, even though there are pieces that they wouldn't clearly argue in Brown. That's not why right, um, that, that decision was made. So I um, uh, end with uh, three books that are from like the same authors. And it's two set of these two authors, Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanik, who um, are themselves scholars within critical race theory. These are books that I've um, read, used, utilized in law school, and, and that have continued being updated, right? But they're uh, the first one, critical race theory and introduction. Um, the second, the middle one is critical race theory, the key writings that formed the movement, which is really going to focus on those like early 70s, 80s into the 90s writings. And then uh, CRT, the cutting edge is, um, is still going back to the 90s, but it's also got a lot of their kind of 21st century newer scholarship. Um, again, I'll leave, I guess I end, end with back to um, Ms. Duckworth and her art and activism and some other accounts and things that you can follow and look into. Um, but I, you know, I know I threw a whole bunch of stuff at you and I had way too many slides um, and I haven't seen any questions pop up. I don't know if that's a good or a bad sign, but I, um, I look forward to talking with you all about this um, and just, uh, you know, discussing which pieces stood out to you. Um, which pieces you, you're interested in investigating here. Um, but uh, again, I really uh, appreciate your, your willingness to listen and, um, and the fact that you've you know, been here uh, for, for these pieces that I've shared with you all. And Matt, we did have one question that came in. Um, oh, okay. I think it was in, during the time that you were talking about the census and the different forms where you check the box of race. And, you know, um, and I know you shared, uh, it looked like kind of an old form, but I think this might help to kind of talk about what forms look like now or what that those census options are now but the question was so do we still consider ourselves quote white on paper when we ask what race we are i think that I'm, i anticipated that question actually i mean it's a it's a very good one and it, it's um it's a it's an excellent question and thank you for for bringing that uh to to our attention i think it's um I mean, it's an excellent one because I, I need to determine for myself at, like at what precise time this changes because I, and I don't know at what precise year or census juncture. But my sense is that yes, in the recent, at least maybe in 2010 and 2020, there's been more of a sense that people of Latin American descent, of Hispanic descent, people of Mexican origin should fill that out according to what they think is, what they think represents themselves not according to this history we're just talking about where they're, they're, they're white because the government says they're white. Um, and so, that, but like, has word gotten out on that? I'm not sure, I'm not, you know, I think it's, it's um, and so, but what, what it does lead to at the very least is that in, in those most recent um, census counts that you do have a lot more people who are again of Mexican origin or Hispanic origin who are classifying themselves as white and also as American Indian and writing in Aztec or writing in Otomi or writing in Purepecha under what type of Native American are you? And again, that's, that's kind of like, you're going into weird categories there where the government classifying you as a Native American is really wanting to know which, which tribe are you that exists within the, con with, with what's, <laughs> that exists within the United States. And so like entering in the tribe's name from Mexico isn't technically supposed to work there, but people are doing it. So I would say that like the, the reality of, of you know, recent times and the 21st century is that, um, yeah, people are being encouraged to actually like mark what, rep what they think rep truly represents them and who they are and their own ancestry. And then again, as those like the DNA piece to me kind of comes to mind also, right? As people realize and maybe for the first time because these are things they haven't talked about in family or in school unless they come to an ethnic studies class unless they're getting into here um that you know investigating that well what does that mean that my dna test is telling me that i'm 60 percent american indian or indigenous to this continent 
when I just thought I was Mexican and we came from somewhere else and we're not from. So, so it's complicating all those things. And I would say that, that the census itself has, has um, there's that, that complication has arrived there as well and made it so that it's, it's more of a mess these days in that sense. If you look into people who are again of Hispanic origin and how they racially classify themselves, uh, people who are of Afro-Latino descent are now being encouraged to say, no, I'm of Afro-Latino descent and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, whether from Mexico or Puerto Rico or, or Cuba um, or, or another Latin American country, right, are encouraged to now kind of share that information in, in a way that's, again, true to their, to their reality. Um, but again, I, I, I think the, you know, for me, a part of what comes up with that question is like, I wonder, like, was there an explicit time where like from the year 2000 onward, the census told us this or is it just what's happened, right? Um, so I hope that answered. I know it was a long-winded answer, but um, I don't know, other um, thoughts or, or questions. I, um, uh, I know, you know, again, and I know here I spent uh, a decent amount of time with, with things that are, um, uh, like I said, coming out of just stuff I teach within um, Chicano, Chicano studies and ethnic studies. Um, but I, I do feel like, again, that those, you know, that those ties were, um, at least in my own life, have been important to understanding kind of getting from one step to the other, but also just in terms of, of um, you know, the, the history of the disciplines that basically um, critical race theory is seen as, um, you know, an outgrowth on some level of ethnic studies that happens in um, earlier on. But um, let's see, are there any other questions or thoughts here to share? No other questions from our participants yet. Okay, all right. Mm. Um, let's see. So I, um, again, I, I want to make sure to, to make that available to anybody who's interested in, I don't know, the, the PowerPoint itself and the, I mean, the, whether that's just the titles or some of the links and things like that. And so, um, you know, I'll make sure that, uh, to, again, to share that. And, uh, um, and we'd be happy to answer follow-up questions that might not occur right now either. And whether that's over email or something else, um, I am more back on campus this semester, though not entirely, but, uh, but I'm over in OAB 174 um, in the old administration building and uh, um, mostly on campus Mondays and Wednesdays in case you again are, you're, you are around and are interested in, in investigating or talking about any pieces of it. Um, or again, not just this, but are interested in, in um, again, I mean, general topics that, are, that, that might be related as well. Right. Well, thank you, Matt. There was a, a comment that came in uh, thanking you for doing this and just that your passion and, and enthusiasm must inspire your students. And I agree. This was a lot of information, <laughs> a lot to think about, but it was a great introduction um, that will lead us into the upcoming uh, seminars and you'll be coming back as well later on in the yeah. semester. So we look forward to that. Yeah. Great. Again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I, I you know, I hope you, you um, I hope to be invited back beyond the ones I'm already invited for. <laughs> I hope to continue on though. And, and again, really to continue the collaboration and um, um, with, uh, with our um, classified professionals on our campus and across the district. And, and again, encourage you to um, give me a call, email me, come by the office if you wanna talk more about any of them. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and thank you everyone for attending today. And again, if you wanna review any of this, if you want to request the PowerPoint, if you want more information on any of the books or the content that Matt shared, feel free to reach out and enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon and your weekend. Bye. You all. Bye.